and you've got Scottish, Aussie, Republic of Ireland and two Northern Irish. So uh, just to continue on, um, just retune into my Northern Irish accent. I have been over in England 20 years, but as you can see, I just haven't got the English accent just yet. So, EBVs, a useful tool or a waste of time. Now, I'm coming from this with a couple of hats on. I'm a large animal practitioner. I am a rare vet who actually enjoys working with beef cattle. We do a lot of beef work. And I actually have a sucker herd myself. So, I actually work with them and um, experiment with them as well. So, we're going to go from the vet point of view. And I talk to all my beef clients about and EBVs and breeding, because I like doing seizures, I don't like doing them in the night, and if we can prevent them and actually use easier calvings and use numbers and make life easier, everyone's going to be happier, especially my wife, because I'm not waking her up in the middle of the night. So, that's just me. Um, so, EBVs, I have another confession as well, I like stabilizers. Um, and I suppose all you Hereford fellas will say, well, at least you're quarter right, okay. Um, and this is just a bull we have been using this year. So EBVs, what are they? Estimated breeding values. And they are estimated. And as Ian and a lot of our other speakers have been today, we're getting a lot more accurate, etc. with them. But what goes in must come out. So the better you put in, the better it comes out. And how useful are they? Just in the audience here, who uses EBVs? Okay, so we've got some people there. Are they useful? Good, yeah, absolutely. I always like to use analogy, it's not like whenever you're betting on horses, okay, as the form, and uh, that's over there, as well as, you know, in the, uh, on the horse um, circuit, you can look at the horses, but what does that actually tell you? This year is actually telling you what they've done in the past and what they're gonna do in the future. But what I get back from my beef clients is, you know a good bull when you see it, well, do you? So, beef recording, we've had Ian talk about breed plan, and I'm very sorry, there is other copies out there as well. We've got the uh, Signet, which is the uh, British one, which is run by the Scottish Agricultural Colleges, and I've just put down a list here of the uh, different pedigree societies that are with the different um, companies, and as you can see, the and the stabilizers are using Signet, but they've got to be a bit separate themselves. But you do have to keep an eye on it because breed societies do like to change between the organisations. So it all comes down to heritability, and this is the uh, definition. So it's the proportion of genetic superiority or inferiority that the animal passes on to its progeny. And so no matter what the animal looks like, we want to know what it's going to pass on and to make sure it's going to pass on what we want. And I think this is very interesting on the right here of the different traits that are heritable. So like milk's only 10%. So if you're looking at more milky cows, there's only 10% of um, that um, good uh, trait that's gonna pass on to their um, offspring. While you come down to things like birth weight and uh, scrotal size, and they're passed on a lot better than the uh, top ones. So again, we have to look at what traits we're after and how quick we're gonna get there with our breeding um, program. So, this is a cartoon here, all the stuff that goes in, so we've got the pedigree data, the performance data, obviously the pedigree data is um, mostly accurate, um, and uh, the performance data is hopefully accurate, um, but again, the better and more accurate goes in, the more useful EBVs will be, and the more trusted they'll be as well. So come down and get the estimate breeding values and then we have an index and that index is the baseline of what we need to compare things with and uh, which is why the more and more information is in, the better index we can get and the more reliable and trusted. And I keep using the word trusted because we need to trust these figures. So I'm going to put it up, this is obviously the uh, British Heritage uh, Society's um, uh, through breed plan uh, that was on the internet which just got off last night. Um, this is Horse, which is the limousine one, and the Charlie, which is again through breed plan. So um, all the different societies have got different face of what they're doing, but what's behind it is the most important. So we're going to have a week competition. Everybody's had a nice lunch, lovely burgers, etc. And I hope people have had a nice ice cream from uh, the milking parlour here as well. Uh, so I want you to choose the bull you're going to put in your herd. Okay, so you have 40 nice heifers, and you're going to choose either bull one, 
or bull two. Okay, so which one are we going to go for? Bull one or bull two to sit for our herd of heifers? Hands up for bull one. Okay, nice bull. Lovely. I know he's a cemental, but roll with me in this. I do all breeds. And bull two. Anybody going to go for bull two? Same bull. Okay. Don't let your eyes deceive you. And that's what the whole thing comes down. And that's what the bull ring, um, people can blow bulls up, make them look really, really well. These are the same bull. Okay. And it goes back to what Ian was saying. A good environment can mask animals of poor breeding, otherwise the ones that can eat plenty of cake, or the poor environment can mask animals of superior breeding. So it's got a right good dose of food. Hopefully not your only, which I'll call the top of it earlier on, but I think it's probably going to work to death this one. Okay, so please just always have that in mind that the eye can be deceived. So I'm just going to wee run through bull problems. Gary's not about from Crocker Farms, so I think that's okay. Um, so I'll just put a, a big limits and bull here. I, I, like Joe has said, I do have a big problem with bulls being blown out of the ground because we do get a lot of problems with them. Um, I want to be able to see he works with these a lot. He says it takes him five months to get the condition on and then in order to sell them, and then five months to get it off before they can work. So as that's what we see is scope of fat. If you grow these bulls too quickly, they put fat down around the head of the scrotum, and uh, that increases the temperature of the testicles and decreases sperm production. Pretty simple. It's like yourself, um, if you've uh, got a duvet around you, you're warmer. Fat around the scrotum, making it warmer, so we're decreasing the fertility of these bulls. So big fat bulls have got fertility problems. Lower condition as well, these bulls have to work and whenever they're so fit, etc., they cannot do the bulling that they need to do. Uh, OCD is a uh, condition that the cartilage degenerates whenever they grow too quickly. Whenever cartilage um, is growing, uh, it puts down scaffolding, that scaffolding comes into uh, bone. And whenever it grows too quickly, the scaffolding grows more and the bone comes into it and falls over. And that's how you get joint problems. Okay, we'll see a number of bulls a year um, push out of the ground and cake and um, go lame. And that's invariably what's down to those today. It's another problem getting fast growing dogs as well, uh, so my small animal colleagues tell me. Um, the condition loss problems, I've seen personally bulls lose a lot of condition, knackers or kidneys because they're breaking down uh, muscle. Okay, so again, what goes on has to come off them and causes problems. And liver abscesses as well, which comes down to rumen acidosis because again, these cake, uh, the cake that's fed to these cattle is uh, causing rumen acidosis. So again, you don't want a big mass of bulls and blown out of the ground because it causes a lot of problems. And at the end of the day, they're there to work for you, and that's where EBDs are good. That you don't need a bull that looks absolutely massive. You need good figures to come tell you it's going to do a good job. So I've just put a bit of a cartoon here. He's obviously alluded to these as well. And I've just broken these into what uh, the different uh, breeding genetics are and where they're useful. Now, for a vet who's advising farmers for easier calving, obviously gestation length, calving ease, and birth weight are so important. Um, and that's very, very good to choose bulls, especially for heifers that are going to calve easily. Because how many people here will help a cow calve? So if you see a cow calve and feet and stuff are there, you'll give it a pull. How many will do that? Yeah, some of you as well. Well, if you're doing any trauma in that uh, uterus, you'll get a mild inflammation of the endometrium, and you'll probably put another 10 to 15 days your calving index. Okay, so that's why natural calving is so important. Any inflammation that's in that endometrium prolongs your calving interval. Have a think about whatever we have to do, a right good pull for a big shardy bull, or we have to do cesarean. All you're doing is increase the number of days that that cow is going to be open, and the decrease in profit is going to be in your pocket. So that's why these are very, very important EDDs. Now the 200 day growth and the 400 day growth is how well that uh, calf will grow. The 200 day growth is obviously down to milk production in the cow. The 400 day growth, if you're a cynical person like I am, um, that's how much cake you put into. Okay, but again, you have to trust the people who are doing these, doing the measurements, etc., that they are true and that the environment they are putting them in isn't manufactured. Obviously, uh, with a dumpy on before me, he's after muscle depth and fat uh, depth which again, that's making a very saleable carcass for uh, the uh, consumer to eat. We'll get into more uh, of the EDDs now we're looking at the ease of calving, uh, interval, uh, calving interval, longevity, all these different ones, which we're just really coming online now, and which I think are very, very important. Um, and the future traits of scrotal circumference, did you know, here's a little fact, 
that the bigger bowls you have in your bowl, the more fertile your heifers. Do we all know that? You know, very important. Um, always makes me smile like when you get the limousines, etc., and they're 34 centimetres at 18 months, when you get in Harry Furs, etc., and they're well over 40, and um, cut something up to 45, 46, so it just shows their um, sperm manufacturing machines, and that they're going to be very good for the uh, daughters as well, are going to be very fertile. So, as you can read value, and this is uh, one of uh, Dave and Maggie's that is and cogent to be a few ourselves at home. Um, and this is what you get. Uh, I know Ian put a lovely big uh, table up, etc. I like looking at these, but I like the one next even better because it's very easy to see. But uh, so what, what we're looking at here, is this? Have we got? Ah, it's there somewhere. Yes. Okay, so here's the DVDs for Daffy across here, which there are a lot of numbers. And there are no use except for this year, which is the index. So this year is the average for the Hereford breed. So whenever I was in a daffy, I'm putting on the cows, so I'm not that worried about uh, cavities. But even though this cavities is minus one, it's not a big lot more, or sorry, it's not much worse than breed average. So it's not a problem. It's good, good accuracy there of 65%. So I'm pretty happy with these figures there. But look across here, it's 200 day weight gain plus 26 and 400 day weight gain plus 57. Good figures, they're going to grow well and calve well. So that's what we're after. So what we're looking for here is um, the figures, but you have to remember that they only apply to the same breed. So we can't um, take uh, Daffy's figures here and put it beside a Shari or put it beside a Limousin, they're just Hereford specific. Um, you need to divide them by two because they are the EDV for that bull. So whenever we're looking at the 200 day weight gain of plus 26 over average, well actually his gross is going to be plus 13 because he's only given half. Okay, and that makes sure that the, uh, if the cow is zero, he's going to give you a 13 kilo advantage over average. So that's what you have to divide these by two for the progeny. Need the breed standard, which I've explained there. And obviously look at accuracy. And um, whenever you've got younger bulls, you might only have an accuracy of 20 to 30 percent, which isn't very good whatsoever. But if you've got some bulls that have got a lot of progeny behind them, you go well up over 90 percent. So you know the rock salt salt figures. This is the one I like: colours and bars, much easier. So we can just see. I get this here, Luther. Yeah. So again, we're looking here. You know, calvin bees slightly less, but you know, its daughters will be a lot better. And um, whenever you're looking down here, good scroll size and um, carcass weight, etc. So they're well to the right, which is what we're after. And again, I've just highlighted here for eye muscle area, etc., which is so important with the heritage breed, is um, doing very, very well with this bull. So I've just put an example in here, and this is I've taken it off uh, AHDB. Uh, this was an experiment done down at um, Harbour Adams, and it was with uh, Angus bulls on uh, dairy cows. So some of done a lot in the uh, dairy sector. So they had uh, one bull here uh, with EBVs in the top 10% of the breed, and another bull here with uh, sour, which were below average EBVs. Um, so you can go down here, better daily life, life weight gain, better carcass weight, better average carcass confirmation, blah, 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 what it made, 42 pound extra per calf. And I think, you know, we can give all these figures, but that there is the most important. It's going to give you more money in your pocket. So EBVs do work. There's a big uh, benefit of choosing uh, bulls and breeding cows as well with good EBVs. They are going to work better. And, you know, we've had myself saying that, rules, um, don't etc. It is there, so please trust them. So I've just put up, obviously there's a, a lot of stuff from uh, AHDB out there, um, and um, you know, so easy, just go on the AHDB website and you can get these different manuals. Any questions? Obviously, oh, she's half, so if say one's 20, another's 20, you divide both by two, 
ten percent. That's what they, you know what I mean. But it's, it's just your know, people are using the They didn't know that he's only spent half that. Okay. I know you know we've got uh, different crossovers, etc. But it's just a good rule of thumb that he's not going to give you that extra. While in the dairy side, we look at PTAs, which are already divided, and America and Australia, they're already divided as well. But we just don't miss country just yet. We're just going to do another five minutes just on uh, sinking cows, and we've done a lot of uh, beef sinks here at Netherhall, um, using AI uh, on the herd. So I'll just run through that, what we've done, and it uh, might just be of interest to you. So Jim Perry called it the boom with the bowler hat, the AI man, and uh, we are using a lot more AI in the beef herd. Um, a lot of benefits because you can use much better coffee, easy calm cows. New genetics and sex semen as well if you want to get uh, more bulls in the beef or more heifers as well. Um, you don't need as many bulls on the farm so you can actually uh, reduce your bull power by increasing your genetics uh, gain in them. And you also can tighten up the calving period which we found some very nicely on quite a few farms. And also the repeats are synchronised so you can watch that for them three weeks after you've uh, pulled the breeds. Downside handling is a problem. Works really well here. We can see the uh, self locking yokes makes a big difference, but there's no getting away from it. The handling is the downside. Um, and owner compliance, you know, you have to do what is on uh, the sheet because if you don't comply, uh, you lose your money. Cost, but a boat can be very expensive as well. Um, boat costs about £35 per calf with a uh, bull lasting five years and 30 calves a year. And I would reckon, you know, it is going to cost a bit more than that for sinking, but you're going to use much better semen, as you can see from the, um, a, or the uh, hard rally study, an extra 42 pound per calf for better bulls. So the sink protocols we use here um, is a poor handling one. So we're um, putting a print along with a shot of uh, GNRH from day zero. Um, we're big fans of pulling the print and giving a shot of cross at the same time. If you can, the second dose of cross at the day eight will give you an extra conception of about 10%. So you have to weigh that up because it's going to be a pain in the backside to get them in. Right, maybe not worth it, but you will get much better conception rates uh, with that second shot of cross at And uh, then day 10, uh, we're doing a single AI, so we're not double AI in these, and um, a shot of generation to make sure the egg drops. Uh, time is crucial, I can't say that anymore. Um, you know, it's so important doing these jobs except at the right time. There is a free handling procedure, um, and it's just dropping out that second job across the landing. So we're doing three handlings, and we're probably going to drop our uh, conception rates by about 10% with that. So again, you have to marry up um, practicalities over um, getting the best conception rates. And again, timing is crucial. You'll get that feed, timing is very important. Um, and we do a, uh, a big synchronization protocol for all our farms and doing all laminated, put a few copies and um, make sure the farmer knows it uh, and what he's doing. Results 70% plus conception rate to four handlings, um, 60% to third three handling. Um, we did one here last year, we're at 75%. Uh, to the first service, which uh, was more than um, agreeable. Um, I have some up to 90%, but then you have some low as well. So it's all down to owner compliance, but um, how the, uh, the condition of cattle are in as well. And then just put into um, context with the bull, um, the benchmark is 65% of cows and calf in the first three weeks. So if you're getting 70%, you're well above what it will you do. Problems, you need to be prepared, that's the most important. Um, cows have to be calved at least six weeks. I'd probably want them calved at least eight weeks to make sure they're outside the uh, lactation and resource of sucking calves. Um, do you need to talk to the vet and AI in good time? There's nothing worse than someone ringing up and saying, oh, I want to sink the cows uh, tomorrow, you know. So uh, we do want to get a bit of uh, you know, preparation. Uh, we want to choose the bull and make sure the AI have it uh, as well. Cow condition, no matter what you're doing, is key, whether you're a natural service or you're AI. If you've got thin cows that aren't cycling, you're pushing water uphill, you're hurting cats. You know, you need a good cow condition, um, and that makes why you, you'll get good conception rates if a cow is cycling well. Um, cat heifers can be a problem if they're uh, losing their condition. 
and make sure your vaccination is up to date and talk to you about it. Um, we use a print, very fond of print, um, easy to uh, apply and saying pretty well as well. Um, the reason we use progesterone is um, they get a tighter synchronization and they also get a bigger embryo, so there's less chance of the cow getting them out. And uh, they're not dependent on the uh, stage of the cow cycle for good results. I really am finished now, no, no part three. So, any questions on uh, sinking cows? I'd probably say between 25 and 30 quid um, for the drugs, etc. It depends if you go for a three handling or two handling, etc. So, it's, yeah, again, you didn't talk to your vet because all vets are different prices. Uh, generation day zero is to make sure that we have a fresh follicle coming on. I always like people to think of it is that like, whenever you have an egg for your breakfast, do you want one that's three days old or ten days old? So it's the same, whenever we put a print in, we're putting the break on the follicle. So if she's in say day seven of her cycle, we're putting the break on the day seven follicle that we're going to ovulate seven days, eight days after that. Well, if we give a GNRH, we're going to get rid of that and we're going to have a really fresh follicle area and that there is going to increase your conception rates again by double digit percentages.